Okay, I'm going to get started here. Um, first, I have noticed that some people have yet to submit Linux Lab 2. Okay, again, I'll impress upon you. Please do not fall behind. Okay, computer science has to be learned sequentially. Um, if you fall behind, it can it can snowball quickly, and it'll be on it'll be beyond repair, beyond hope. Um, do not fall behind. If you have any problems, come see me, and I'll make sure that you're up and running um, with us, the rest of the class. Um, so again, and this hat this goes for any computer science course, or any math course, or any other course, but, it, but it's particularly important in computer science. Okay. So if you're missing things, get to them now. OK, today we begin Lecture Module 3, which of course is Chapter 3, Storage. Um, and there's also Linux Lab 3. And that actually kind of co coincides, because we start looking at the Linux file system. Um, as we look at storage, well, of course, I'll cycle back to Kreider's Law there. I did want to, again, just draw everyone's attention to the recent emerging topics. Um, hackers launch Apple ID phishing campaign amid iCloud security fears. Okay, This is social engineering. We'll learn later on when we get to security that social engineering is even works even better than almost any other type of, or it's done first in, t in terms of hacking. Um, so of course it's in the news. We all know about the iCloud, you know, security um, flaws, and it was actually it was revealed that it was um, weak passwords on behalf of the celebrities who were using weak passwords. And again, you know, we continually set, state, you know, don't use your dog's name, your cat's name. Well, you know, celebrities may. Um, so, but again, we all it's in the news. iCloud security. So suddenly you get an email, you know, and it preys on your fear. Oh, click this link. And immediately your system is compromised. Um, another interesting thing, this was um, either today or yesterday, Google is holding public forums over in Europe and they're seeking input on what is reasonable for them to purge, get rid of old information. So they're actually looking out for people's privacy. And we'll talk about um, Google as, as a business down the road. Um, but in, in the tail end of this course, we'll start talking about computer ethics. And actually, I'll slowly introduce over, over throughout the course. Um, and in, in ethics, we look at, say, three distinctive classes. Social contract theory, stakeholder theory, and stockholder theory. And we'll get into all of them, but social contract theory. Social contract theory states that an organization should do more good than the resources it consumes. Okay? And Google really does take this approach green computing, um, a very good organizational culture. And again, right here, they're now seeking public input. What does the public want? They want, you know, what kind of time frame does the public want for us to get rid of our data? I can't imagine any other big company, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook, ever doing this. Facebook is going to hold on to your data forever and use it for their profits. Um, so again, We'll look at Google and business and security and all these things down the road. Um, but getting back to storage. When we look at storage, the first thing I want to, everyone to keep in mind is Kreider's Law. They recall what Kreider's Law was. It was essentially the equivalent or the corollary to Moore's Law. So we see that storage technology is seeing the same exponential increase as processing power. Actually, Moore's Law is linear. Um, and storage is, is linear too to some extent. Um, but keep that in mind, please. Um, so let's just jump right into the PowerPoints here. I put this up just to kind of refresh everyone's memory. Um, the memory hierarchy. It's also commonly referred to as the storage hierarchy. And what the memory hierarchy or storage hierarchy states is that as we move out from the CPU, Memory and storage will get slower, but it will also become more affordable. And we find this in many areas in computing, that we have this trade-off, efficiency versus effectiveness. In this case, it's cost effectiveness. Um, because we can't afford to build a computer with all this high-speed memory. It would just be too expensive. So we balance it. Okay? On a CPU, of course, we have very fast registers and cache. 
And then, of course, we move out to the RAM, which is kind of a nice intermediary between the cache and storage. And we're going to look at all the characteristics um, of storage in this, in this presentation. So let's begin. Storage. Um, when we look at storage, we can distinguish between the medium and the device. Now, in some cases, the medium and the device will be a single unit. You look at a USB drive, right? Okay, it's flash storage, but it's integrated into the device itself, which is a USB connection. We look at the internal hard drive, the magnetic hard drive, right? We have the platters, the magnetic platters that spin, okay, on the spindle, but they are housed and integrated with the device itself that actually does the reading. Okay? In some cases, the medium and the device are separate. You can look at the DVD or the CD, right? I have a DD, DVD drive, but I have DVDs. And of course, I put the DVD in the DVD drive, and it reads or writes the DVD. Uh, the medium and device can be internal, external, remote. Okay? Um, I added something here on that last bullet, because um, the book, and, it, and it's correct, Storage devices are typically identified by letter. That is correct. But what the book doesn't stress, or at least illuminate, is that drive letters are actually dynamic. Okay? They're assigned, and you can statically map them or assign them, but quite often the operating system will assign them sequentially. Okay? So if you have, say, an external DVD drive and a USB drive, well, it depends on what order you connect them to your system on which letter they get. Okay? It depends on the operating system. It depends on a few things. So just note that people, you know, they'll say, especially on campus here, we'll refer to, you know, the H drive, the G drive, things like this, okay, as if they are, you know, static and unchangeable, immutable. But that's not the case. Here they are statically mapped. But drive letters are typically um, allocated dynamically. Okay. When we look at storage systems, we can distinguish between volatile and non-volatile. And again, we're using, you know, we're, I'm throwing around these terms, memory storage, or maybe I'm just throwing around the, the term storage. We know we can distinguish between memory and storage because memory is non-volatile, excuse me, is volatile, to where if I turn off the power on the computer, of course, whatever the contents in memory, they go away. Whereas the hard drive is non-volatile. I turn off the computer, the hard drive should retain Whatever its contents. What else? What's the further differences between memory and storage? Well, memory is byte addressable. Addressable at the byte. Remember, the byte is the smallest addressable unit. And there are two things associated with every byte, the address and the contents. Whereas when we go out to storage, we're going to see the smallest addressable unit will be the sector, or actually more often, the cluster. And I'll get to that in just a minute. When we look at storage, we need to distinguish between random and sequential access. Random is direct access, okay, which means direct access requires an address. It can be referenced. Okay? Now, um, sequential access, of course, is your the best example, of course, is the tape. Okay? I write serial starting at the beginning to the end. And if any of you are, hey, by the way, let me ask, how many people out here have never used, say, a cassette, audio cassette tape? Okay, never, so use one? never use one. Okay, so so people. Okay, I, I just need to know and when I really truly date myself, because you know? <laughs> at some point we're going to have a generation that has never touched a cassette tape. It's probably not too far. I, I, I always went to an elementary school. My mom is there. There's a kid. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm running Doctor Job after class today. Learning to program. I'm like, you're ten. That's great. Yeah. And of course, it doesn't count if you went yeah, to like the Boston yeah. Scientific Museum and you used yeah, a cassette exactly. player there. Uh, but yeah, probably not too far in the future. People will have no idea what an audio cassette tape is. But if, but if you remember, audio cassette tapes, you know, if you wanted to find a song, what you have to do? Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Is that it? No, nope. fast forward, fast forward. No, you go past it. Rewind, rewind. Okay, that's sequential access. Okay, so a computer, we almost take for granted that we have this random or direct access based on the address, and that is a property of the device, the medium. But know that that may not be the case for all types of data. Okay? Up on the board, I, I did this for last class. I won't walk up there this time. Um, I just drew a little table. And what you see is a table, columns for social security number, a column for last name, and a column for the first name. 
let's take a look at this. Well, if I have a table of data, right, rows, where everybody here you know, has an entry, their social security number, their last name, their first name, I can sort this table based on any one column, right? I could sort, sort the social security numbers. But as soon as I sort those social security numbers, the last names and, the first, and first names are in entirely random order, right? Someone with a social security of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 could have the last name of, you know, Polinsky, Williams, okay? Someone with the next lowest social security number could have the last name Anderson, okay? So I can only sort a table based on one field, one column. So while I have these devices that have or support random or direct access, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the data can be accessed directly. Because what if I have that table and I sort the, sort the, rec the records, the rows, based on social security number? What if I want to find someone with the last name of Luby? What do I have to do? I have to compare every record. Is this Luby? No. Is this Luby? No. One after another. Sequential access. So even though it's in memory, or maybe somewhere out on disk somewhere, okay, that is, of course, directly accessible, but at the block level, not the record level, I still may have to do sequential search. And we'll see this in database. What do we do? We create indexes. And we're going to see this in operating systems because operating systems and increasing functionality now is search, right? In fact, it's, it's the big thing in Windows and Mac is how good your search works. So at this point, the operating system is indexing the data on your hard drive. Okay, so we have volatility, volatile versus non-volatile. We have random versus sequential access. And of course, just because, as I just presented, even if a medium or device supports direct access, it doesn't necessarily mean all of the data is in a format that it can be directly accessed. OK. Now, logical versus physical representation. I introduced this already, right? And, I, and we'll get, come back to it in operating system. The operating system is the resource manager. It manages physical resources. You know, your keyboard, your screen, the printer. And it manages logical resources, internet connections, files, OK? I put up the, um, the definition of abstraction. Just added that this morning, just to make sure it was there. Um, the separation of the idea from the physical implementation. And that's actually what the operating system and even a lot of these applications do for us, right? We know that the machine architecture is working with ones and zeros according to the machine instruction set, the architecture. Um, we don't want to deal with that. When I store a file, I don't want to think, OK, I'm going to store a file at cluster you know, 1 million, and then the second portion of it I'm going to store at the next you know, free cluster at 2 million, the next one 3. I don't think of that. I just think I have a Microsoft Word document. It's my paper. right? There's that logical file representation of the file name. And I let the operating system manage the specifics, that mapping, okay, from the logical to the physical. Because at some point, that file needs to be saved on my physical hard drive. So it needs to be broken up into clusters and saved. And I'll define a cluster here in just a minute. So when I ask, what performs the physical to logical address translation? Yeah, the answer is the operating system. So when we look at the logical representation of the file, and now you know, when we're talking about logical file representations, we're actually talking about operating systems. Okay? The operating system is the resource manager. The file system is probably the most visible aspect of the operating system. Why? We work with files, right? I have MP3 files. I have high-definition movies. I have papers. I have all these things. And we think of them as files. So the file, again, is the logical representation, um, anything stored on a storage medium. And we associate every file with its file name. And again, the file, can, file name can have two parts, right? It can have a file name, it can have an extension. And certain operating systems will work on extensions intuitively, right? You have your you know, file manager, whatever, and you have a file with a .docx extension. You double click on it, Microsoft Windows knows enough, because it has the association to open Microsoft Word and load that file. Okay? Not every operating system will have those associations. Okay? That's a convenience feature. And we'll see when we get to operating systems, yeah, great. It's great for convenience, but it takes resources. Right? 
all those little things add up to the RAM that is necessary to run Windows. And if you have an operating system that requires a lot of RAM, memory, to run the operating system, you have less memory available to run your application. Everything else runs slower. Great, your operating system is real fast, but everything else is a complete dog. Okay? And we'll look at that. Folder. Folder, also known as a directory. And here's a really interesting thing. Well, interesting to me, which means it's probably not that interesting. Um, in computer science, forever, we refer to what is now referred to as a folder as a directory. When Microsoft came along and said, oh, we're going to rename it. And it's kind of interesting that they can do that. Because in almost no other discipline, I mean, this was, this was core computer science. Files, directories, you know, you read any operating systems book. Um, to have an organization come along and rename something, that was a basic fundamental term. You'd, ne you'd never see that in biology, right? Uh, no longer are we going to call things phylum or species or kingdoms. I'm going to call it this now and rename something. So it's kind of interesting that Microsoft could come along and just rename this fundamental concept. Um, but they did, and now we're all using or calling them folders. But when we get back to Linux, Linux Labs, they are directories. Folders are directories. And really, the proper name is a, is a directory. So when we look at the directory system, the folder system, okay, what is it? Okay, the file system. The file system is hierarchical, okay, which means it has, of course, levels. Um, it's, we have the concept of parents and children, or folders and subfolders, directories and subdirectories. It is an inver inverted pyramid. So the root is at the top, or at least this is the way we represent it. Okay? And we'll see the root denoted by the slash there. Okay? So if I ask you what is the root directory in Linux, it's the slash. Okay? So if I look in this first level, okay, I have the folders bin, dev, home, etc., lib, user. And these are standard in Unix and Linux. Okay? Anybody know what bin stands for? What's that? Well, what, what do we just do with numbering systems? Binary. Okay, yes. Okay? So they're binaries, which means they're executables. Okay? This is where um, the core part of the executables for Linux are stored. Okay? So these are the programs, you know, you'll be doing, <coughs> start to use my voice again. Um, ls, all of these core commands are located in the binaries. Dev, what do you think dev stands for? Yes. Developer? That, that, and I always get that. No, but if you think about it, an operating system doesn't care if you're developing. That's more of an application standpoint. What does the operating system manage? Resources, right? Devices, okay? Printers, things like this, okay? Um, I won't go into the others. Um, I did want to introduce, though, because I did introduce this in, in the Linux labs, the concept of a namespace. So I just added this this morning. Okay? It's a, a namespace is a set of identifiers. And in computer science, of course, in computing, they must be distinct. Or we must be able to dis distinguish or disambiguate between them. Right? In a computer, I cannot have any confusion. Okay? Um, I need to discreetly, deterministically determine each step and each path along the way. <clears throat> so, when I look at this, of course, I have the etc. directory, subdirectory here, okay? But now, and it's hard to see, but I have another etc. down at this other level. But I can distinguish between them. I could not have another etc. at this level, or bin, or dev, or anything else home, right? Because that would be ambiguous, okay? A namespace must have unique identifiers. But I can distinguish between this etc. and this etc. by providing the full path. Okay? So what, what do I do? Of course, the full path. This etc. here is home okay, or, or root slash etc. This etc. down here is root user, USR, slash, so I, I'm um, um, separating the directories and subdirectories by a slash etc. So that would be slash user, et cetera, would be this, et cetera, right here. And of course, I can uniquely distinguish between them. Slash, et cetera, is different from slash USR, et cetera. Okay? So there's no ambiguity there. So any particular level 
will create its own namespace because if I provide the full path name, I can distinguish between them. Okay. Storage system characteristics. Uh, won't go into this in real detail. We're going to go over it. magnetic, optical, and electron. So let's start looking at the hard drive. Okay, it can be internal, external, yeah, we know that. Can be encrypted. Now, when we talk about encryption, though, it's not really a factor, or it's not it's not the storage device that's doing it. It's the operating system. The operating system is encrypting the media and, and the, um, the data on the media. Okay, so so note that when we talk about encrypting hard drives, things like that. Um, I'll say this 10 or 20 times throughout the course of this course. Um, you hear, hear me state that security is 75% policy. Okay? Um, I'll give you an example, and I'll repeat it um, several times. If I choose to never connect my computer to the Internet, the likelihood of me catching a virus is probably about zero. Right? I just have my computer and I never connect it to anything, it's pretty safe. Okay? Me choosing to connect it to the internet is policy. Security is 75% policy. Okay? Encryption. Okay? If you choose to encrypt your hard drive, right? Policy. If you're an organization, you can enforce or require that employees encrypt their hard drives. And why would you do this? Well, someone leaves their computer, loses their computer, it's stolen, whatever. It's unusable to whoever gets it. Why? Because they require requires a password to access the anything on it, the operating system, the applications, and the data. Um, by the way, how many people have crypto hard drive? My recommendation is encrypt your hard drives. You, you never know. Um, let me ask you this. How many people, to some extent, save their password keychains in their browser? At least for you know basic sites. Do you let your browser save your passwords? Not the value. Yep. Log on and Blackboard does it for you. Okay. What about other passwords? Google, Gmail. Google do you have to? You know, this is this is your policy. You know, do you save your passwords in your keychains? Um, think about this. If you're not encrypting your hard drive, should someone get your computer, they can just turn it on without a password, right? Or there are ways to bypass it. Maybe you have a password set in the operating system, but there are ways around that too with a USB drive, things like that, where they can start pulling these things off. So I highly encourage you to encrypt your hard drives. Question? No, just, okay. Actually, actually, do you ever watch those DEF CON videos? Um, the DEF CON conventions they had out in Vegas? Um, there, there was one about a guy, and he got his computer stolen in Boston, and then he spent like three years following the guy <laughs> through it, and like, you know, he had the key loggers and everything, and eventually got the guy's home address, his Facebook, and all that. Just like, it was like a... Client service, I mean, when it came back on from the DSL, yep. he was able to find it and he just tracked it all down. The guy had a key logger and stuff, yep. a key chain, so he did all the guy's passwords, but it was his computer. Yep. And then he, you know, sent the cops after the guy three years later. After, after you have some fun with him. Yeah, yeah. 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 he was sending messages to him because the Mac was going to make speak right. without showing anything up, so he's like, I'm going to get you. And then That's right. Pretty cool, though. Yeah. Stuff of movies. Um, Okay, so let's take a look at how a hard drive is constructed, how it operates, because this is important understanding for our understanding of the memory hierarchy. Okay, so here, of course, is the picture. I have my my platter. Okay, and of course, this um, spins around. Um, but let's take a look at what it is. So I have tracks, sectors, clusters, and cylinders. Okay, so I have it, I have it right here, and you can see this. Um, and I'll cycle back to this. So if I look at just a single disk. Okay, I have concentric tracks. Okay, that go around. Okay, um, I divide these tracks into pie-shaped sectors. And here, the sector is the smallest addressable unit on the hard drive. Now, quite often, the smallest addressable unit is actually the cluster, because we'll group sectors into um, powers of two into groups that will form a cluster. So if I have, of course, and a sector is 512 bytes, so if I have four sectors to a cluster, the cluster will be 2,048 bytes. Or quite often, it will be, you know, 4,096, eight sectors. This is the smallest addressable unit, the smallest transferable unit. 
So if I need to change something, recall what I said, if I need to change something out on the hard drive, I can't do it directly on the hard drive. I have to read it in, change it, and send it back out. And I'm not just reading in one byte. I have to change one little entry. I am reading in an entire cluster. I'm changing it, and I'm writing it all back. Okay? And there's security or forensics implications here as well. So here I have, again, my tracks, my sectors, and I group my sectors into clusters, and that will be the, my, my smallest addressable unit. Okay? So my smallest addressable unit in storage is the cluster. Okay? It will be some pow power of 2 you know, multiplied by 512. Smallest addressable unit in memory, of course, is the byte. So here I have four platters, so to speak. Each platter will have a read-write head on each surface, so both the top surface and then, of course, underneath. So if I look at these four disks, four platters, I'm going to have eight read-write heads. Okay? The read-write heads sit on the mechanical arm, and they move in and out. The platters, of course, spin, so when the data spins underneath the read-write head, of course, I can either read it or write it. Okay. Now, why is this important? Well, if we take a look at the actual access time. And let's recall, remember what I said with my memory hierarchy, as we move out from the CPU, things get slower, but also more affordable. The CPU, let's say, is moving, you know, three gigahertz machine, right? Is is executing instructions at three billion clock cycles per second. Three billion clock cycles per second. Now we're going to start talking about this storage device, the magnetic drive, and what does it take to actually get to a piece of data on the hard drive? Well, first we have the seek time. Okay, That read-write head has to move in and out over the tracks. So I have to find the right track, that first, that concentric circle. On average, 3 to 12 milliseconds. Okay? Again, 3 to 12 milliseconds in contrast to 3 billion cycles a second. These numbers are just so extremely far apart. OK, so the read-write heads are now positioned over the correct track, but now it has to wait for the disk to spin underneath it. OK, even a fast disk, you know, 10,000, 15,000 rotations per minute gives us an average time of about at another 3 milliseconds. So if I look at my seek time, 3 to 12 milliseconds, average 6 milliseconds. Now I have a rotational latency, 3. I'm now up to 9 milliseconds. And then I have the transfer rate of 1,000 megabits per second. And recall, small b is bits per second, right? Capital B, bytes. Okay? File sizes come in bytes. Okay? So quite often, if I have a large file, you know, let's remember I'm multiplying by 8 to get the actual bits per second, the, trans the transfer time. So again, this figure, you know, 6 milliseconds plus another 3 milliseconds plus the transfer time just to get into memory. And I may have to write this back to this, right? If I'm going to change something, I read it in, I change it, and I write it back to disk. Well, quite likely, almost for, for sure, that read-write head has moved. So to write it back to disk, what am I doing? I have another seek time, more rotational latency, and another transfer time. All the time, how much time has take, this taken place? You know, probably you know, half a second or something like that. Depends, depends on what else is going on. Um, or that may not be reasonable. How about how about um, a tenth of a second? In contrast to the CPU, which is moving at three billion cycles per second. Okay, you can see that the latency of getting anything from the hard drive is just is just immeasurable. Okay, so hard drives. We are seeing the evolution slowly to solid state drives and maybe even hybrid drives. Um, they are expensive. You know, going up to the solid state drive on the Mac, MacBook Pro adds about another thousand dollars. That's huge. The performance is great though. Um, it uses less power. So of course the MacBook Pros that have solid state drives, you get great battery life. Uh, they're more resilient to falls. When we talk about, you know, disk crashes, where does where does that term come from? That comes from um, the read write heads actually physically making contact with the cylinders or the platters themselves. It's a disk crash. Uh, of course, if there are no moving parts, flash memory can quite often withstand a fall that a hard drive could not. Okay, so we have internal and external 
we won't go into that. You know, um, connections. Mac has gone to a Thunderbolt connection, which is real nice. Uh, but even USB 3.0 is getting real fast. Um, so we're starting to see, you know, nearly equivalent speeds to what an internal hard drive can do. Um, so disk caches. Disk caches are necessary. They really do improve improve performance. Um, they can be, you know, part of the RAM, um, or they can be a separate chip on, on the device themselves. Um, disk caches can take advantage of what's called locality of reference. This is not in the textbook. Okay? I'm just going to put it out there for you. Um, in program logic one, you're writing programs, right? And you're using, you know, statements one after another. So there's some sequentiality. Um, so you can see that the statements that are going to be executed are localized, spatially. You write one after another. Okay? And this happens quite often if you look at an executing program. It executes instructions that are close together. Or it calls you know, a different module, and that's loaded into memory, and then that module executes. Um, so I've, that's spatial locality of reference. There are also, also temporal locality of reference, to where, based on the time, certain code will be run over and over. And you can see that, of course, with apps and things like that. So hybrid drives are here. Kind of define this last class. It's a combination of a magnetic drive, um, ladders, of course, and an SSD, to where you can offload anything that's used over and over. I put it in the in the in the flash drive. Why? Because it's much quicker. In fact, that is a example of locality of reference. Okay, if I'm using certain components over and over or at particular time frames. Whether you do it personally, it's better, of course, to, like, to take the Mac approach, um, where Mac will monitor your system and take anything you use a lot and migrate it to the flash drives to the storage. Okay, partitioning. Um, partitioning still has a use. There was a time, you know, way back in my, my day, uh, we habitually partitioned our hard drives. Why would we do this? Why? Because we'd cut up our hard drive into several logical drives. One reason was because they'd be smaller. Because they were smaller, my cluster size would be smaller. Okay. If anybody has a calculator, take out you know what are what are typical hard drive spaces now? You know, one terabyte, okay, one trillion, okay, one trillion bytes. If you were to divide that by a sector, 512 bytes, see what you get. And you're going to see that the address space, even in a 64-bit computing, okay may not be large enough to, to, to uniquely address every sector, which is one of the reasons why we group sectors into clusters. Okay? Um, so partitioning, if I partition my hard drive and break it up okay, into smaller drives, I can get smaller cluster sizes. Why is that important? Well, think about a, a file when we start looking at lost space on the system. Say I have a 100-byte file, and I store that in a 4,096 byte cluster. I'm wasting nearly 4,000 bytes, right? 4,000 bytes is just empty. What if my cluster size is only 2,048? Well, now I'm only wasting 2,000 bytes. With any file, I'm always going to have some lost space, some slack space. And we'll look at that when we get to security, because there are other implications there. Um, no file is going to always end at that 2,048 or 4,096 byte boundary. Okay, and fit perfectly inside you know, a, a sequence of clusters. So I'm always going to have some fragmentation or lost space on the hard drive, slack space. Now I won't, I'll come back to this. I'll say, why, you know, hopefully keep people's interest here. Why is that important? Well, we read data from a hard drive and write data from a hard drive in cluster sizes. So let's say it's 4,096. Quite often when I write something, okay, of course it's not going to always fill out the last cluster. So say I have you know, a 10,000 byte file. It's going to put the first 4,096 in one cluster, the second 4,096 in the second cluster, and whatever else is remaining will put in another cluster. There will be a lot of slack space. But the operating system won't write just that whatever was remaining to fill out that 10,000 bytes. What's it going to do? It's going to grab whatever was adjacent in memory and write that to the hard drive. 
Why is that important? Okay, I have a bad person. A bad person who is on a website they shouldn't be on. And unknowingly, and everybody does this, of course, we just save files. They save a file, they save something. And the heart and the operating system starts grabbing memory, okay? But at the tail end, it doesn't, you know, there's more, it needs more information to fill up that last cluster. So it just grabs whatever was next in memory. That could be the open browser on whatever bad page this bad person was on. And that gets written to the hard drive without that person knowing it. So even though this person had great practices in trying to stay, stay secret, the police, FBI, whoever grabs it, the hard drive, looking at the hard drive, I can see in the Slack space, oh yeah, right here. You never saved that web page, but when you wrote another file, your operating system grabbed that portion of memory and wrote it to your hard drive. And this is digital forensics. Okay. I'll get back to this when we get to security give some demonstrations. Um, so partitions have a great use today. Um, computer manufacturers use it because they will put a um, recovery partition in there. Um, and it really cuts down on their help desk. Help desk is pure overhead to an organization. You know, you launch this product, great. But then you have a help desk there to help, and you're paying people on your help desk, and depending on the level, you know, you may be paying them a lot. They're not selling any product for you. They are just, you know, you're paying them to support product that's already been sold. With recovery partitions, of course, it makes it very easy. You know, your system's corrupt. Oh, we're just going to reinstall. We're going to blow away your data. You're going to lose everything. But at least from the businesses, from Microsoft or Dell's, perspective, I'm just going to do it. My help desk technician can move on to something else. You know, your data's gone up, but your system's up and functioning. So from Dell's perspective, cool. Bless you. Okay. So again, file system is an operating system function. Um, I did highlight XFAT. Um, and in CIS 100, I did provide more information on this, or probably more than you need to know. Um, but this is important when you're looking at like thumb drives. If you want a thumb drive to be read by every operating system, and at least efficiently, um, you could use FAT32, but XFAT is probably a better way to go. Um, and of course, it could be read by Mac, by Windows, and by Linux. Um, Windows 8 has caught up to Mac. For a long time, Windows, the Windows 8, Windows 7 file system, Windows XP, all these, really lagged behind Mac. Uh, Mac went to an extended journaled um, file system. A journal file system maintains a transactional log, so it can actually recover from errors, uh, which is very nice. You know, you don't want to lose data. Uh, but Windows 8 did catch up. The resilient file system did move to a uh, journaling type system. And should you want to read about it, I did include some important information. Um, hard drives. I won't go into in detail. You can read about them. Um, it's really we just want to be familiar with the names, knowing that serial ATA is what we're pretty much, you know, the, the present standard. Um, SCSI. Um, you'll see a lot more in the data centers, things like that, um, and then of course the newer fiber channels, things like that. <clears throat> um, looking at optical discs. So now we're talking about DVDs, CDs. Um, I highlighted in red, added this this morning. The book says, you know, optical disks are today's standard for software delivery. I, I think the internet has probably overtaken and surpassed that as the standard. So I wouldn't say much more. Um, optical disks are physically arranged differently than magnetic disks. Um, optical disks have a single track. So not concentric tracks, you know, adjacent to each other. Single track starts middle, and then spirals outwards. Um, so, um, so let's just say there. Um, you should know the difference. Of course, three types, read-only, recordable, and rewritable. Um, how the technology works with CD and DVD is there's a laser that's projected to the surface, and then whether it reflects back or not indicates the presence, or whether, whether it's one or zero. Of course, read-only, the disk can be stamped, so there can actually pit, be pits or valleys. Um, and this is enough to interfere with the light so that it's not reflected perfectly. Okay? So I now can distinguish between ones and zeros. Of course, 
your computer at home that has a recordable or rewritable DVD drive is not going to be burning pits into a disk. So the way that they work is a little bit different for recordable versus rewritable. Um, recordable will actually change the surface properties, kind of in an immutable way. Um, so it can change the color of it so the way it's reflected back is different. Whereas with a rewritable re disk, you have to be able to change several times so it actually uses a phase change technology. Uh, flash memory, <clears throat> you don't need to know I added that there are two types, NAND and NOR. You don't need to know that. Um, I just put that up there. Um, but if we look at that, I, you don't even need what's in the parentheses to understand it. NAND uses block accessible. Okay, when I talk about blocks, I'm talking 512 bytes. So if it's NAND, what, what, what is addressable at 512 bytes? What's addressable at 512 bytes? Or what's addressable at the single byte? Addressable at the single byte is memory, right? Every byte in memory has an address. Okay? So if I look at that, NOR is byte addressable, so it's re replacing the electronically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. Okay, that's my bias, right? Because it's byte addressable. So NOR will be memory. NAND is block addressable, 512 bytes. 512 bytes, very similar to the hard drive, okay? The block versus the sector, okay? So NAND will be used for our USB drives. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's seen, by the way, Staples. It's through a rebate, but they now have, it's 128 gigabytes. USB drive for $44. So, um, and I, someone just told me b &H Photo has one for $40. That's just ridiculous. Crider's Law. Ridiculous. It was an option that just comes in. It was a gigabyte solid state drive USB plug in for $250. You're kidding. That's incredible. It was on sale for only back Still, to school, but. Yeah. When you think 250 for a terabyte, uh, and Mac is charging an extra grand, <laughs> yeah, and that may not be—it may be down to five or seven hundred. Again, the price just keeps dropping. It's funny you say that because laptop I bought from school, uh, I was originally going to get a different version of it. Yep. That was like seven hundred dollars. Went to Sam's Club, and it was a different brand name for like five hundred. Yeah. Same specs. It, it's, and everything. it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I won't go into embedded flash memory. And again, as, as flash just keeps dropping, more and more we can put you know, embedded computing, um, higher, greater processing power, plus greater storage. Um, I won't go into flash memory cards. We know about them. Um, flash drives. Um, flash drives you know, can be a security nightmare. Um, actually, someone came out with a one terabyte USB drive, just a little, not, it's kind of a little, it's a little bulky, but still a terabyte. Um, it's a security nightmare. I mean, literally, you can walk out with an entire organization's information on a little phone drive. Um, so, okay. Um, other types of storage. We're going to talk about um, cloud storage, or actually cloud computing throughout this course. Uh, many people here are using cloud you know, storage, I use it, G Drive, Box.net, Dropbox. And again, there are you know, iCloud. Um, there are security concerns, you know. You can, but hopefully, you know, if you're you're following good practices in your home as well. Um, but it's not only that, it's not only security, but it's also privacy. Um, because, of course, these companies that are offering cloud storage, well, they're looking at your data too, okay, and using it for marketing purposes. Um, so just be aware of this. Um, is anybody running network attached storage, by the way? They have NAS in their house? It's great. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's just a something. And to some extent, network attached storage, and the, and the line is being blurred now. Uh, network attached storage always meant or indicated that the storage device was you know, connected by an Ethernet. It would fit into an Ethernet port. But now you look at today's Wi-Fi routers that are coming with USB ports and data hard drive. Um, so to some extent, you know, it's, it's network-attached storage. Uh, 
Note that it's great for sharing media throughout your house. Note that if you do want to use it for streaming media, okay, just by having a network accessible hard drive or a hard drive plugged into a USB port does not necessarily mean that you can stream data from it, you know, movies, things like that throughout your house. If you want to be sure that you want to do that, um, make sure it's DLNA compliant, so the Digital Living Network Alliance. Uh, and if it's DLNA certified, which means you can stream any type of multimedia through your house, you know, so Wi-Fi TVs, things like that. Um, I keep hoping. Anybody have a Google Chromecast? Really? What, yes. do you, what do you think? They're fantastic. Okay. Amazing. When, when they first came out, they actually supported um, accessing network hard drives. Yeah, it, uh, I noticed that it went from like only being Hulu and Netflix yep. to three months after it came out, when every video you can stream from mm -hmm. the internet. Yep. Stream directly into yep. whatever. But but you could also in the first iteration, you could access your hard drives on the network, yep. and then they took it out. And, and I, I, it was stored like the uh, your hard drive, like music. Yeah. Uh, Have Pandora. they restored that yet? Yeah. They brought it back. Pandora, anything that plays music, videos cool. on your phone, okay. your tablet, whatever. Because I bought one because I had read that you could do that, and by the time I bought one, they'd taken that functionality out, so I returned it. You know, Best Buy. Um, but now that I know, I'll research yes. again. If, if you could do that again, it's cool. It's like $30 or something, oh. and they're fantastic. I don't have a cable box in my room or anything, but yep. I'll watch TV shows yep. from my phone. And, and so you can screencast and all that. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. Um, try not to digress too much. Um, you know, we look at these overhead projectors. Those things go for five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. You know, and businesses still buy them. What's the cost of flat screen TVs these days? It's ridiculous. Four hundred dollars, great. Yeah. And you get a Chromecast for thirty-five dollars, something like that. Okay, plug it into the HDMI port. Okay, and then anyone that enters that business conference room can project their iPhone, iPad, computer screen up to that. So rather than paying ten thousand for those projectors, which businesses are still doing. $400 for a big flat screen, $35 for a Chromecast, right? It's just, if you understand the technology, there's these simple little fixes that you can do that will save an organization a lot of money. But nobody looks at it like that, so again, that's why we're here. Um, okay, so online storage, we know. Okay, smart cards. I'm not going to say much about smart cards. Smart cards, of course, they do store data. Quite often specialized, though. You know, it's using for encryption. It's, it's like a security card, something of this nature. Uh, I'm still waiting. By the way, anyone, anyone patiently waiting for the Apple announcement? Or no? Phone uh, block. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, it looks like Apple, well, I think it's going on right now, actually. Um, so they finally are introducing near field communications and a bunch of other things. Um, as soon as I get out of here, I'll take a look at that. Holographic storage. OK. It, you know, I can see the merit in some cases. But it's a worm technology, which means write once, read many. Which means, OK, for data that you're just writing once, great. OK, you can write a million bits of, at a time in a second. So it has high capacity, because what it does is it uses multiple beams. If I can, can, I, can I go over that slide? Yeah. Um, one beam will have the data itself, and the other beam, will, the reference beam, will change where it is stored within that 3D storage media, the holographic media. Um, so I'm um, going to storage servers right now. Um, do you need to know about basic RAID, redundant array of independent disks? <coughs> uh, it's probably easiest to describe this from a picture. Uh, there are many different levels, by the way. RAID 1 through 10, who knows how many there are now. Uh, but if we look at just RAID levels 1 and 2, OK? RAID level 1 is data striping. Okay, so I can write data to two drives at once. So this, of course, is going to be a speed improvement, very similar to you know we saw that an eight eight byte bus or 64 bit bus was twice as fast as 32, right? An eight lane highway is twice as fast as a four lane highway. <clears throat> so intuitively, if I'm writing the same data, if I'm, I take half of it and write it to one disk, and take the other half and write it to another disk. 
I'm going to do it in half the time. Okay, so there's a performance increase with, with grade level one. Um, grade level two is mirroring. And we do this for fault tolerance. Quite often, the, there are several mechanisms we can use to provide fault tolerance. The easiest or most straightforward is just redundancy, duplication. If I take the data, write the same data to two drives, of course, if one drive fails, I'm, I'm still fine because the other drive will have that information. So understand minimally grades level one and two. Magnetic tape systems are still in use. Okay, why? Because they just cost pennies. Um, now, one of the things, and you'll be asked at some point to determine this, you have to fit your backup strategy to your organizational needs. Okay? For certain industries, you know, um, if we were to lose our data here at the college, well, it depends on what time frame, too, but um, we use tape because, okay, if we spend one night restoring everything overnight, okay, it's fine. Very different for Amazon. If Amazon systems go down, every second they are down, they're losing, I think it's like a million dollars, it's, it's a crazy number. Um, so they cannot afford to be down. So probably tape backup is not prudent for Amazon. If something happens, they need to get back up and running instantly. Okay. So you have to assess your needs. What's the cost of the media? But what's the cost of your data? What's the cost of your work? Um, so. Again, tape will work for some people. <clears throat> Please understand the differences with backup. There are three different types, three different levels, so to speak. Full backup. This is what most per people do personally. Okay, I put a USB drive in and I copy over several directories. A month later, I want to backup my system. I put that same USB drive in and I just do a full backup. Right? I copy everything over. It takes some time, but again, I'm not backing up that much. Hopefully. Um, Organizations cannot do this, right? I cannot just do full backups of terabytes over and over on a daily basis. I can't do this. So you need to understand the difference between a differential and an incremental backup. Okay, and you've used these again. It depends on what's your business analysis. Differential. I do a full backup, and then each successive differential backup, I back up the files since the last full backup. So say I have, I change my Word one document. And then the next day I change and I back it up. I change my Word 1 document the next day. I would save the new copy. I do it the next day, save the new copy. So now when it comes time to restore, I restore the full backup, and then I restore that latest version of that Word document. Okay, Not too bad. Incremental saves even more space, but it also pro uh, can provide even a current versioning system. Because now I'm going to keep saving all the small little incremental data levels changes in a file, which is great because you'll see this year if some, at some point in Programming Logic 1, you know, you'll be like, I wish I had what I had on Wednesday. I went ahead and changed it and I kind of went took a different turn and I'm now further away from my solution than I was in, on Wednesday. So the ability to go back to that intermediary step on Wednesday, very attractive. Okay, so evaluating, again, you need to understand your business, but you also need to understand the storage media and its characteristics. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to cy cy kind of circle back and do the fetch execute cycle simulation. I didn't get to do it last week. Um, it really goes beyond what the text does. We didn't need it for the test or anything like that. Um, but it'll really help with everyone's understanding of what's actually taking place at the machine cycle level. So I'll do that tomorrow. I'll probably do a couple other things, just kind of lab type stuff, file system. So it should be good. See you tomorrow. Uh, are you ever going to talk about net neutrality?